Okay, welcome to lecture 20. We're now getting into the final block of this course. Uh, and today we'll talk about server-side testing and debugging. We'll get started with that. And then we start and uh, we continue in lecture 21 with the second part of it. So what we'll do first is we talk about linting of JavaScript and, and Node.js JavaScript. So it's basically trying to do static analysis on JavaScript code. Then we go into debugging Node. We have already done a uh, regular debugging of JavaScript applications in the browser. Now we'll transfer that to Nodes. And then we do the same with unit testing. So we have done unit testing in the browser. We'll now do unit testing for Node.js. And then finally, we talk about a concept that's called stubbing or mocking, uh, which is an important concept in unit testing. It applies both to the browser and to Node.js. There are all sorts of learning outcomes. They all go down to testing uh, server-side applications. So that's what we'll talk about mainly today. Um, and there will be different parts to that. The, the literature references are essentially uh, kind of connections to tools. So ESLint is, is probably the most popular linting tool for JavaScript. Knock and Sinon are tools for doing mocking stubbing, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and then there are two how to's on how to debug Node.js code. So that's just for reference. So this is something that I have mentioned in lecture nine already. It's a bit of a repetition, but uh, quality assurance on, on a large scale is not just about testing. Tests, automated tests are absolutely needed and they give you a quick feedback on if a, if a bug develops, um, but you need other things. And one of the things is a debugger because it's much, much easier than placing console logs in your code. Uh, so that's something we do. And then another thing that helps you to even avoid mistakes before you get there is to use a linter. So you can, in, you can enable strict mode that prevents you from doing certain things in JavaScript. You can try to follow style, style guidelines, how to structure your code. But then there is a linter and those are tools that uh, check your code. So uh, a lot of errors, we know that can be avoided when the code is written properly. So when you write messy code, if you have kind of different, uh, different way of writing code at different places, then this leads to errors. Not only because you miss things, but also because you might go back to your code a bit later or someone else tries to modify it. Uh, and then if it's not very easy to read and it doesn't follow any style, then there will be errors. So uh, linters are tools that help uh, by analyzing your code. They just look at the code, they don't run it, and then they highlight issues. Uh, they can be used uh, to highlight common problems that lead to errors, but they're also used to enforce style standards. So for example, companies use them to uh, enforce that you follow a certain indentation standard or a, for a certain variable naming standard. These tools exist for almost all programming languages. Uh, we'll look at JavaScript here, of course. Uh, in JavaScript, we will use ESLint, which is, as I said, one of the biggest tools. Uh, there are lots of options to configure this. I'm not very good at it, but the good thing with, with ESLint is that you can actually install predefined styles, for example, from Google or from Facebook that uh, they just use their style guidelines. Uh, there is an integration to VS Code if you install the ESLint plugin uh, and there's integration with Node.js. So you, you can install, if you follow these steps, you simply have a tool that uh, can statically check a JavaScript file. So you can just run ESLint myfile.js and then my file will be checked and you get a console output. I'll quickly show you how this works in VS Code because that's a, a good thing to have. Um, so let's just open a project, uh, for example, the Minesweeper code. So the code that actually is running uh, for assignment two that is providing the, the backend uh, functionality. And it does use a, a bunch of different things. It does use a, a database. We, we don't go into that. It's not very important, uh, but we'll now show you how to run ESLint in here. So 
given that you have actually installed the plugin. So you have to install the ESLint extension, uh, otherwise this will not work. I have done that, so I can just go to um, finding the right thing, <laughs> the command palette, uh, and then there is one point that is called create ESLint configuration. And I'll just click on that, and then I get the terminal, and it asks me different things. Uh, so what I want to do, for instance, is check syntax, find problems, enforce code style. Um, what type of modules do I use? Uh, I use JavaScript or CommonJS. I use CommonJS. Which framework do I use? No framework. Where does your code run? It runs in Node. Uh, and now you can basically answer questions. You can uh, check automatically or you can use an existing style guide. So I could, for example, go in and say, please use the style guide that Airbnb is using. Let's do that. Uh, what format do you want your config file to be in? I don't really care, JavaScript. And now it starts doing stuff. It starts installing. Would you like to install? Yes, please. Um, so there's all sorts of installation with NPM going on in the background. All the, the right tools are uh, being installed. And then it creates a file in here, uh, which should be visible in a moment, but uh, there is a hidden file that is called eslint.rc here. Uh, that's basically our configuration. So how should we run this? Um, and now if we go into app.js, you'll see all sorts of stuff. My code is all red. Uh, and that's all the problems that the linter has found. So some of these, if you scroll down, some of these are uh, warnings. Uh, for example, we don't want anything on the console. Uh, that's a common thing. You want to use a specific tool for logging, not just logging to the console. But other things are actually errors. Uh, for example, Airbnb in the Airbnb style guideline, they do not want me to use var. They instead want, for example, let. Uh, and then that works. Then there's another problem here. Express is never re inside. So I'm, I'm creating a variable that I can change, but I'm never changing it. So I should use const instead. So you already see that there are quite some things that are, they're not necessarily errors, but they can lead to errors. So it simply highlights those things. And then there's other things like here's the indentation. Uh, Airbnb has a standard of using double space indentation. Here I have four. So if I instead do two spaces, it stops complaining. So this is really more a style thing. What you have seen before is more a potential source of error. And then Airbnb uses single quote styles. So I should use uh, single quote, not double quote. And I'm unable to find my quote here. And now it stops complaining. So these kind of things are what a linter does. It helps you to, uh, to find problems in your code. Uh, and fix them. So that's essentially what it does. And uh, this is very common at companies simply to avoid errors and to enforce a certain standard style. Now, if I want to get rid of this in, in VS code, uh, you simply delete this file. Uh, and now if I reopen this directory, then the, the warnings and the problems will disappear. So. Uh, if I reopen the file, you see now it's all gone. So that's what we want to use a linter for. It's a good idea to try this out and get used to it. Also, if you, for example, do your, prior, uh, your final projects, uh, try to use these things so that you get a common style of writing code. Uh, in the beginning, these things are often a pain in the, in the butt, basically. So you need to get used to them. Um, but after a while, uh, you get quite used to them and then you simply have a very common style if you code with a bunch of people or an entire company. And that's, of course, a good thing. As I said, uh, ESLint allows you to have these reusable styles. So uh, you can simply go to the ESLint website and check that out, what kind of rules you can set. So that's the part on linting. Uh, now we'll jump into the debugger. We have done uh, debugging in the browser. So you have seen that before we had a we had, uh, let's find something. For example, in one of the early assignments. Uh, was it lab three? Yeah. 
in lab three, there was this task to uh, to run certain things and there is already testing going on here automatically, so I cannot do much, but I could go in here and I could go into the debugger and actually uh, debug my JavaScript file. So I could set different breakpoints uh, and then run the debugger. So if I print my number, I would end up in the debugger and I could uh, look at the call stack. I could do, look at the scope, different variables. So we did this. Um, now, of course, we have the problem that uh, we are in Node.js, so we're not longer running anything through the browser. So, of course, we cannot debug through the browser. That doesn't work. Uh, so this is why we'll have to look at how do we run the debugger in Node.js. The principle is exactly the same. So we can use, for example, the VS Code debugger. It looks exactly the same. It's just about how to connect to it. Uh, and what Node allows you to do is it allows you to run a, a piece of software in debug mode. So you simply add this inspect flag. Uh, instead of just running Node app.js, you run it with minus minus inspect. Uh, and then what happens in the background is that there is a specific port reserved for debugging. So you can connect to that uh, with any kind of debugger. Uh, I'll show you two here. We can look, uh, we can use Chrome for that. We can use VS Code. Um, both is fine. So we'll look at exactly the same things we also did for the browser. An important thing here is, this is one of the issues that's mentioned in the OWASP top 10 and the security issues. Uh, please never leave the debugger open when you're in production because people can connect to it. They can read all the details of your code. They can look at different things. So that's uh, quite a severe thing. So be sure you only run this in a protected environment or for kind of specific points in time when you need to check something. Okay, so let's try a, a server. Um, this is the, the Minesweeper thing. We can just run that. Um, so let's go into that. Uh, I need a database, so I need to run my Mongo database. That's just a tool. It doesn't matter if I would use anything that doesn't have a database. That would also be fine. Uh, so before that, I was running the application with Node app.js. Then it starts. Uh, now, if I want to have a debugger, I simply add minus minus inspect. Uh, now you see there is some more debugger listening, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, now the code is running, I can use it. So I can uh, I can just go to my, my browser and do localhost 3000, Minesweeper generator. So it does work as usual. Um, that's the important thing. Now, if I want to connect the debugger, I need to use a debugging tool, for example, Chrome. Let's open Google Chrome. And I just go to Chrome colon double slash inspect. And if I do that, I should get something here. So it automatically found that there is something that has a debug port and then I just do inspect. Uh, and then I'm here in my inspection mode. I have already started doing things here. So that's why you see something. Uh, but you see, this looks familiar. There is the debugger up here as the call stack. Uh, we can look at different things. If you do not see any code here on the left side, so if you cannot select any files, you might first have to add folder. So you might first select the right folder and, and open it. That's what I did here. Um, now, the important thing is now that we can do exactly as we did before. For example, we can go into any of my uh, routes. So this might look familiar to you. It's, sli it's programmed slightly different, but this is the code that gets called if I do slash rules. So I can, for example, set a breakpoint here. Uh, and now if we go back to, into our Firefox, for instance, uh, if I just run the regular code, uh, if I go to slash, everything is fine. If I go to slash rules, you see that it starts loading here in Firefox. Nothing is happening. Uh, and in Chrome, you actually see that it has paused, we are in our debugger. And now it's exactly the same as before. So we have our call stack. Uh, 
we have the scope, we can look at the variables, we can, for example, look at what is in the request, what is the IP address that has sent this, uh, it's not very interesting here, what's the host name, so the request came from localhost, uh, and then we can look at the headers, for example, so these are the HTTP headers. So we can look at that and then, uh, as before, we can sort of jump to the next step here. We can go into a function call, we can do different things. And when we're done, we can just say resume. Uh, and now if we go back to Firefox, you see that it has loaded. It hasn't been successful, but that's okay. Uh, at least it has finished executing the server has sent the reply. So this is one way of doing it. Um, the other way is by running the code through VS Code. So you can also run the debugger here. So what I could do is uh, I simply create a new launch configuration. So I go to run add configuration and I say, for example, attach. There are different ways of doing this, but I can say attach. And then here I have the debug port. So where do I want to connect? Uh, and now, for this to work, I actually have to run my server with the inspect mode as before. Uh, and now I can go to the debugger and I can select here my attach configuration and do start. Uh, and you see that it has somehow connected through it. Uh, and now I'm in my code here as before I can start setting breakpoints. I've done that here already just to give you an example. Uh, so now if I go again to my rules and I press enter, instead of Chrome, I now end up in my VS code. Uh, and if you then go to the debugging view, again, you have exactly the same. You can look at the variables, you can look at the call stack. Uh, and you can, as always, jump over, do different things, continue. So that's another way of debugging. Uh, and then when you're done, you just close the application. Uh, so those are the two things I'll, I'll show you here. Uh, and in assignment four, you will have to use the debugger a bit just to get you used to that. Uh, it's an important thing just that you go in there to really use it in a productive way. You have to keep using it for debugging. It's really a good help. So try it out. Okay, that's the first part. Now the second part of the video will look into unit testing again.